Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I just realized that uh, you must have all had quite an early start in the morning, and it's been a long day. Uh, and now that you're faced with the monologue of a suite for 30 minutes, came to think of a story that I'd like to share with you before kicking off, actually. Uh, it's a story about four gentlemen, a Swiss, a Frenchman, a Swede, and an Englishman. And uh, actually, unfortunately, they're kidnapped. And uh, the respective governments won't pay the ransom, but, so the kidnappers are faced with a problem. They really like the, these gentlemen, but they're saying that, sorry, guys, uh, we'll have to kill you. But uh, because of the fact that we think you're pleasant, we will give you one last request. Uh, so the Swiss has his first go, and he says, well, for me, I'd be happy if it would be sharp, 1900, and if I could have a piece of chocolate before that. And the Frenchman said, well, uh, a good meal, a good French meal with some good French red wine. And uh, that would be my request. And that would be granted. And then uh, the Swede made his uh, request. And it was, uh, I'd like to make a speech, a 30-minute uninterrupted speech. <laughs> and the kidnapper said, I think we can uh, meet with that request. And then finally, the, the word went to the Englishman. And uh, he simply said, uh, I'd like to be shot before the Swede. <laughs> so I hope you can bear with me for uh, 30 minutes or a little bit around that time. Uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Expanding Product Indications Through Increased Scientific Understanding. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, touch briefly on the, uh, the scientific uh, discoveries that have been made in the last decades. Uh, spend a few words on the disease understanding and also touch on the subject that seems to be the dogma of the day, more or less, uh, collaboration. And then I will um, end up by um, uh, illustrating repurposing in some different aspects and here I will become more, uh, more pragmatic and more clinically oriented and then a few concluding remarks at the end. And indeed, we have discussed uh, the importance of, uh, of uh, new trials, of observatory trials, of registries, etc. But the fundamental research that has uh, uh, more or less exploded in the last decades have uh, given us uh, completely new uh, visions on the possible treatments of different medical diseases. And uh, the advances in, in the molecular biology have much been through the, uh, the tools in, in molecular genetic research and molecular biology, thinking of uh, methods like the cDNA libraries, uh, the PCR technology, microarrays, RT-PCR, GFP, well, the list could be made very long. There's also been some uh, vast improvements in, in the high throughput screening. We have uh, analytical methods of different class now. We have uh, uh, liquid chromatography, tandem mass, uh, spec, NMR, and a number of others. But I think one of the milestones that have uh, opened a lot of doors for us is really the, uh, the sequencing, sequencing of the whole human genome, uh, opening the door to, uh, to a fantastic field of proteomics. We've spoken about proteomics and, uh, and the genetic disease or genetic understanding of the disease, which is now more or less in place in many instances, not all, but in many. But we also touched on uh, what I like to refer to as pharmacogenomics, meaning that each individual is unique, its age, its gender, its uh, life experiences, its genes. This all comes down to uh, uh, tailored medicine, personalized medicine, and uh, uh, a way to detect beforehand almost who might respond to, to what drug and in what instances. There have been a number of new technologies and we're in the beginning of this era. I think we have uh, a few examples already of uh, enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, and uh, we are also talking about enzyme repair as well as uh, gene therapy. We've also touched on the fact that there are very many different uh, rare diseases present today in the world. I think the quote has been 7,000 most of the times today. But I think there was a very important comment by Seguloen here earlier today that maybe there are, in realistic terms, more like 1,200 diseases that could actually be looked upon as a disease where we could find a treatment and actually introduce an effective measurement for these diseases. We know that there are uh, challenges here. We have touched upon them several times today. Uh, there's a large diversity within the rare diseases. There are small populations. There are very few common denominators. 
It's uh, difficult to have patient accessibility and there is a, a definitely challenge in, in the clinical feasibility. We also have uh, challenges in looking at the possible end points in, in, in our trials, looking at biomarkers, surrogate markers, and uh, not to say the least, the national history, the outcome often seriously, life-threatening disease makes it even more difficult. We have a number of stakeholders, which has become very evident uh, during the day here. We have a number of different important patient organizations. We have uh, with society and authorities are also taking their uh, responsibilities and are contributing in various ways. Industry, of course, uh, through their own companies, but also in different organizations and initiatives. And you see a few examples in the slide here. I also very recently came to learn about Innocentive. It might be very familiar to all of you, but that's a, an organization, a platform of some almost 200,000 participants exchanging uh, information and uh, possible uh, research adventures. And recently, they uh, collaborated with the Rockefeller Foundation focusing on rare disease. So uh, evidently, there is much focus within the rare disease area. It has been said uh, many times today, and I'm happy that even I have a picture of collaboration. And uh, indeed, this is uh, a necessity in order to succeed in this field, and we need to, um, to collaborate cross borders, cross companies. We need to uh, uh, collaborate with academia, but most of all, we need to listen to the patients, to the patients' needs, and what their every life, everyday life situation is like. So from, uh, from an industry perspective, what can we learn from academic research and patients? Well, what I just said, in a depth understanding of the everyday life of the patient and his or her relatives. And from academia, the, uh, the pipeline development, new understanding of pathologies, new hypotheses to test, research models to test hypotheses and develop compounds, uh, and especially uh, animal models. And of course, last but not least, to, uh, to establish the network of experience and uh, centers of, uh, of excellence. Speaking about repurposing, that I would be do quite, quite shortly here, but uh, there's also another example of this where industry is giving back a little bit of what academia has, has produced uh, and contributed. And to take one example from my own company, uh, Sobi has contributed with a, a, a quite a large number of, of uh, molecules back to uh, the Karolinska Institute the small molecules, and there are a number of other initiatives uh, from most of the larger pharmaceutical companies. Pfizer has the open innovation, Eli Lilly has the connecting compounds to patients, and I'm sure the other companies have similar uh, initiatives as well. And of course, industry can, can assist in, in, uh, in giving a, a advice in whether or not going directly into patients, toxicity data requirements uh, with patient groups. I think both academia and industry could have that. And then, of course, scientific advice with the, with the authorities. Uh, this uh, knowledge with the regulatory um, guidelines, the, gu the regulatory map is becoming more and more uh, known to most of the stakeholders here. There's also an area, an avenue where the industry could, could be of assistance to academia. And last but not least, uh, perhaps also to some extent, financial assistance. So I do represent uh, Sobi. It's a Swedish company focusing on rare disease. And our mission is uh, to develop and provide valuable treatments and services to rare disease patients and their families. Uh, we're not that big of a company. We are approximately 500 employees. And in order to fulfill our mission, we are uh, very much clear on the fact that we need to collaborate. And we need to collaborate with academia, with partners, with regulatory uh, authorities, and most of all, with patients. And uh, by that, I'd like to become more clinical, more pragmatic. I'd like to share with you uh, an exciting story of a product that is uh, one of our uh, flagships, if I may say so, in our portfolio. And um, in order to understand this fully, I will uh, try to brief you with the metabolism of tyrosine. So when you leave this room tonight, I'm sure that you will be able to, uh, to dictate the different steps of that metabolism. This is a picture of a, a plant called the bottle brush. And from this plant, uh, a substance called NTBC is derived. It was uh, initially intended to become a herbicide, uh, but for several reasons, uh, that did not actually uh, materialize. However, through a number of steps, it became a drug with the commercial name Orphidin, which is today a life-saving drug in the disease of uh, tyrosinemia. 
And here is the uh, central molecule uh, of the um, discussion that I will be sharing with you now in a few minutes, tyrosine and the metabolism of this amino acid. As you know, tyrosine sources in the body is through protein uh, catabolism, and it's uh, also synthesized from phenylalanine. It's a precursor of uh, adrenal hormones, neurotransmitters, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopa, uh, thyroid hormones, and melanin. In the disease of um, tyrosinemia type 1, there's a deficiency in one of the enzymes in this metabolism. And as you see in this slide here, uh, HT1 is caused by a mutation in the gene coding for the enzyme fumaryl acetoacetate hydrolase, or more easily FAH. So when that enzyme is not functioning or is uh, uh, absent, what uh, the consequences of that is that you get an accumulation of the uh, substances within the dashed uh, rectangle there. You have uh, malyl acetoacetate, MAA, and fumaryl acetoacetate, FAA, and succinyl acetate and succinyl acetone, all very toxic metabolites. So uh, this disease, as you understand, is mainly expressed in the liver, but also in the kidneys. And the consequences of this enzyme deficiency are deleterious. Orphidine or NTBC has um, its mode of action by blocking an enzyme upstreams to this. And by blocking the enzyme pyruvate, we actually never run the metabolism any further than that. However, this fact does create a, a high level of tyrosine, and, uh, which leads to some important consequences that we will be discussing quite shortly. So there are basically two different types of tyrosinemia type 1. There's an acute one with acute presentation and one with a chronic presentation. And uh, the acute one uh, is a dramatic disease that needs uh, appropriate attention, immediate attention. And as you see in this small child here, it has a very extended abdomen, uh, most uh, likely caused by an expanded liver uh, and to some extent also spleen. And this is a picture of what the liver could look like in a patient like this. It's a micro macro um, nodular cirrhosis, the total liver is, is affected, and to the right hand side of your slide you see uh, the uh, deleterious development in some of these patients, they actually develop HCC or hepatocellular cancer. And this is our drug that was uh, approved in 2005 for the indication treating tyrosinemia type 1 in combination with diet. And the results of this drug are phenomenal, if I may say so myself. To the left, you see, in the left graph, you see the, um, uh, the consequences of the disease only treated with diet, which were quite radical. Patients did not reach their upper teens. But uh, with orphidin and diet, as you can see on the right graph, uh, almost 100% survival. And the patients that were treated when this drug was introduced are still on treatment. And this is a small Indian boy. Uh, with tyrosinemia. You can easily see he's hypotonic. He has an enlarged liver that is uh, uh, well, sketched on his abdomen there. He's irritable. He uh, does not have a failure. He's a failure to thrive and he could not even stand up. Uh, six months later with the treatment of orphidin you see a remarkable recovery. He's gained weight, no hypotonia, he can walk around, he can even play around, and the liver size has become more normal, as well as the normal liver function tests. So it's a dramatic effect. Switching to a, a different uh, disease, alkeptonuria. Uh, this man is famous for his pioneering work within the uh, inborn areas of metabolism. It's Sir Archibald Garrett who uh, spent the most of his uh, active life studying different diseases present in the urine. And um, he also wrote the book, Inborn Errors of Metabolism, and was the one who detected that the first genetic disease to be described was alkaptonuria. And this is the original publication in 1902. However, it, uh, uh, although he was the first to describe it and also to, to explain the genetic background of the disease, actually already in the Egyptian times, uh, Alkaptonuria was known and described, not the cause of the disease, but uh, the fact that the urine turned black, which was thought to be uh, um, quite an endeavor, and the people that had this disease were regarded as almost gods. However, uh, 
So there, in some of the mummies, you have actually uh, been able to detect the fact that they had alkaptonuria, which is quite astonishing. Uh, although the fact that the disease has been apparent and known for quite some time, there's, uh, there's still no treatment, there's no cure for alkaptonuria. And here you see uh, two uh, uh, jars of, of urine, and um, this is how easy the, di the, the, the disease can be diagnosed, actually, because when the urine is exposed to oxygen, the, the, the um, homogentisic acid is oxidized, and that's the shift in color. So AKU is a hereditary disease. It's an autosomal recessive one. The incidence is approximately 1 in 250,000. In some areas, it's much higher than that. And it, here, the, the gene, the, the deficiency here, is in the homogentisic acid oxidase an enzyme in the metabolism of tyrosine. And the, the consequences in accumulation of HGA, or homogentisic acid. And uh, this is the uh, metabolism that I expect you to know after this presentation. And uh, we're focusing on the middle here, and uh, this is the metabolic pathway of interest for our discussion here. So uh, down to the left of this slide, you see uh, the um, consequences of tyrosinemia type 1. And uh, looking at alkaptonuria, where you have the, uh, the accumulation of homoantisic acid due to the fact that there is a deficiency of the enzyme homoantisate dioxygenase. And as you know from my previous slides, you know that nitisinone uh, blocks the enzyme upstream to this, meaning that uh, there won't be any homeantisic acid produced. Here are some classic diagnostic features of AKU. You see the auricular ochronosis, which is basically uh, an accumulation of HGA in the, in the out outer ear. You can see the same uh, phenomenon in, in the eye, the ocular ochronosis. And also at the bottom here, you see uh, a rather uh, advanced uh, ochronosis of the shoulder joint. So this is what a joint would look in a normal condition. And this is what it looks in an alkaptonuria patient a few years later, or may maybe even a few decades later. That is what we really don't know at this stage. And then the end stage is a totally uh, ruined uh, joint. So their treatment of AKU, as I said, there's no uh, cure. Uh, these patients uh, try to live a good lifestyle, not too much activity, try to have the right diet, the right job. There has been some attempts with uh, vitamin C, but that has not been proven. So it's symptomatic treatment with pain relief, joint replacement of surgery, etc. We're looking now at could enzyme uh, therapy, gene therapy be alternatives? That's currently being investigated. And also now we're looking at the possibility of having nitisinone as a treatment for these patients, mainly because of the fact that it uh, would block the HGA. This is a rather busy slide, but it explains very much the, the mode of action and also how effective the treatment with nitisinone is in this case. So the, the pink line here represents the HGA level. The blue line represents the tyrosine levels. And up to the, in the upper left corner, you see uh, the, where the treatment is initiated with, it, uh, with the nitisinone and the dramatic drop in HGA. But also in parallel to this, you see an increase of the tyrosine levels. So in the upper right, the low protein diet is introduced and you see a reduction of the tyrosine levels. You also see how the colors of the urine changes as the HGA level is decreasing. The disease, uh, the natural disease, the natural history of the disease is not fully known, I should say. So the part what I showed you here on the HGA and the ochronosis, exactly when it occurs, what the first signs are is not known. But um, the development is thought to be there from more or less the start in life, the birth. So presently, uh, there are uh, large attempts to find a cure. And uh, a collaboration consortium has been uh, uh, founded now, and the, the driving force here is, is the patient organization, the AKU Society, that have put together the Liverpool, Liverpool Hospital University, PSR, uh, one of the co-sponsors of this conference, and Swedish Orphan Biowitrum that are uh, collectively uh, collaborating in order to, um, to develop and to see if uh, nitisinone can become a treatment for these patients. So there is an orphan drug designation uh, for, for nitisinone in AKU. The disease development is over several years, which is a challenge. 
we're looking at biomarkers and a surrogate marker could very well be HDA. Presently, uh, there's a, an application to the FP7 program. Uh, a development program is in place and uh, well, from a few years from now, we will be able to see whether or not we have succeeded. Moving to another disease, also uh, relevant in the tyrosinemia uh, pathway. This is uh, oclocutaneous albinism. It's a very rare disease, although in this picture, I think the prevalence is 50%, but that's not the case in real life. Oclocutaneous albinism, it's, uh, it's an autosomal recessive disorder and it's reduced pigmentation of hair, skin, and eyes, and uh, there's a varying degree of visual impairment. There are different forms of the disease, OCA1, 2, 3, and 4, depending on which gene has been mutated. We're focusing on the, the OCA1A and OCA1B. There's a mutation of the tyrosinase gene. Uh, the tyrosinase gene uh, catalyzes the initial rate-limiting step in, uh, in pigment, in melanin production. And in OCA1A, there's a complete absence of the enzyme, whereas in OCA1B, there's residual tyrosine activity. The prevalence of the disease is approximately 1 in 40,000. And today, there is basically no treatment for these patients. There are correction of the refractory errors, extraocular muscle surgery, but the visual impairment persists. Skin protection due to the risk of uh, uh, ultraviolet-induced carcinogenesis. And uh, what could be uh, the situation with high levels of tyrosine? Could they improve the tyrosinase function? High levels of ambient tyrosine stabilizes tyrosinase and increase pigment production. That has been now shown in animal experiments and in in vitro experiments. And evidently there is a correlation between visual function and the amount of fundus pigmentation. Looking again at our famous um, metabolic pathway of tyrosine, you're quite familiar with the first two steps here. And looking up to the right, you see the albinism. It's actually possible then to have an impact on the visual impairment by raising the level of tyrosine, which is basically what we regarded previously as a side effect of uh, treatment with nitisinone. This is an experiment from a publication that was uh, very recently published. It's, uh, this is in mice. And uh, the upper two, A and B, it's uh, the wild-type mice. And in uh, panel C and D, you see untreated OCA1B and OCA1A. And then at the bottom, you see the OCA1B and OCA1A. And so the E is the interesting one, where you see after treatment with nitisinone, you start seeing a pigmentation of the retina, which is actually the first signs of an effective treatment. And we only see this in OCA1B because they have residual effect of tyrosinase. Patients with, or mice in this case, with only uh, OCA1A does not have any tyrosinase at all, and therefore the treatment is ineffective. This is another experiment also with OCA1B mice, where the mother has been uh, treated with nitisinone before giving birth. And, uh, to the left, you see untreated mothers giving uh, birth to, to uh, almost white mice, and the retina has no pigmentation at all. Whereas uh, in the right-hand side, you see mothers that have been treated with titisinone, and uh, these have a much darker fur and also pigmentation of the, uh, of the retina. So the next steps in this uh, project is really, can titisinone improve visual function in humans with OCA1B? There's a pilot study starting now to look at this, and if the efficacy can be documented, uh, this could be a candidate for future medicine. And uh, with the history that we have with the uh, orphedine toxicology and safety data is already available, why a development program could be successful in a shorter period of time. So very, very briefly now to finish up here. Uh, Totally different disease, Morbus Parkinson, uh, which is not at all rare, but it's an example of the fact that rare diseases can actually have a possible impact on more, uh, more common diseases or more uh, well-known diseases. Parkinson, as you know, is a progressive neurodegenerative condition with loss of dopamine nerves, nerves and also death of nerves producing dopa. There's absolutely no clear understanding on the cause of the disease. 
The classical symptoms are, as you know, tremor, rigidity, stiffness, and slowness of movement. There is no therapy that cures this disease today, and it's the second most common neurodegenerative disorder. And for the last time, our metabolic pathway, and you see by increasing the amount of tyrosine, we could actually, uh, this could result in an increased production of dopamine that could, to some extent, help these patients. So the early uh, trials in this indication have shown that there is uh, good results uh, seen with PET and clinical parameters, parameters have been improved. This has been done both in monotherapy and in combination with L-DOPA, which is uh, the, the basic treatment today. Uh, however, the phase two trial that has just been finished was, was not conclusive. The uh, development in this indication is uh, not done by, by our company, but by BioT therapies. So to finish off here, uh, the primary effect of neticinone was uh, what drove the initiating drug development. The fundamental research and clinical drug discovery over the years have been drivers in a successful life cycle management. The primary effects uh, were clear, but the, the fact that the secondary effects, the adverse events, were actually treatment opportunities is something that we learned along the way. So by knowing the mode of action, toxicity, and safety data may actually shorten the way to, uh, to patient use. So Orphadin is indeed a remarkable product. This, in 1993, the first patient two years old received NTBC. And to the right, you see the same patient uh, six years later at the age of eight. Thank you very much.